Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us in an over, another Nobec talk. Um, my name is Paulius. I am the managing director at the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics. Um, and welcome again to our talk. We will follow a very similar agenda to our previous uh, talks. First, there will be a very short uh, welcome. Then we will see the pre-recorded video from uh, this week, this week's uh, early career researcher, uh, which is Anna Hochleitner from the University of Nottingham. Um, and then we will have our main talk uh, from Dr. Max Winkler from Harvard University. And then we will have 15 minutes for questions. So uh, just a short reminder, as always, that this um, series of talks is organized by the Penn Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics. We are a research center at the University of Pennsylvania, founded by uh, Christina Vicchieri, that does consulting research and training to enable organizations to sustainably, sustainably enact positive behavioral change. You have a QR code here to follow us on Twitter, and you have our webpage as well to learn more. Um, and also, um, as I do in all the talks, I would like to tell you a little bit more about um, one of the center-related um, initiatives that we have here at Penn. Uh, today, I would like to tell you a little bit about our Penn Master of Behavioral and Decision Sciences. Um, this um, um, master is informed by contemporary theories and research methods of behavioral economics, decision sciences, network analysis, and public policy. Um, it's um, quite special because it's an interdisciplinary professional program um, based on practice. It's, um, it has an innovative curriculum, Ivy League resources, um, lots of connections and, and student, um, good student outcomes, and, and a very good MBDS community. The next information session is on October 27. You can find more information in um, the website, um, also about the, the information session, or, or you can ask us. Um, and then two um, things that are very good with this um, master's, in my opinion, apart from the wonderful um, teachers and, and associated faculty, is um, the wide range of electives that people can take all around um, Penn, uh, lots from the Wharton School, and then the broad connections, um, which um, work for internship and for design challenges and for the consulting course, as you can see here. Um, and one piece of news that we sent out in the reminder email today as well, is that we are hiring a director for the master's degree. So if you are interested, if you know someone that, is, that could be interested, or um, if you have a network in, in behavioral and decision sciences, please help us to share the, the post. You can find the information on the email that we sent today and also scanning this uh, QR code. And I will send you on the chat uh, of the call the, the direct link for you to see more information and to apply. In terms of uh, our programming, we have uh, for now three talks left, apart from the one for, for today. Um, in our summer uh, programming, uh, you can find all the information in our website once again, scanning the QR code. Um, and we will also soon announce um, the continuation after this in for, for September and October and then until next year. A few ground rules. If this is the first time that you are um, connected, uh, please mute yourself during the talk. Um, if you can, please keep your camera on so that we have a more interactive experience. Um, if you want, it would be nice if you could um, please change your username to see um, your affiliation as well, to, to know where you're connecting from. Um, for questions, you can either use the chat during the talk, or you can also use the raise hand function at the end during the Q&A time. Um, we don't have a call uh, this time as in previous occasions, so um, you can use the the chat and the questions will be answered at the end. 
And then we are transmitting this on, on Facebook Live and the recording will be on our website as always. Uh, with that, um, let's go to our early career researcher video for uh, this week. Um, the presentation was made by Anna Hoschleidner, a PhD student from the University of Nottingham. Um, it's called Strategic Behavior with Tight and Loose Norms. Uh, you can see here um, her profile um, in the link and you can scan the QR code as well. So let me share the video now. Thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to present today. My name is Anna Hochleiten and I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Nottingham. The project I'm going to talk to you about today is called Strategic Behavior with Tight and Loose Norms, and this is joint work together with Eugen Diemand, Michelle Gelfand, and Sylvia Sonderegger. The motivation for this project um, really comes from the observation that a very powerful factor influencing human behavior are social norms. And what previous studies um, have typically been doing is looking how information about the mean behavior of others is affecting individual decisions. However, one dimension that has been paid less attention to is the variance of behavior. And this is exactly what we want to look at in our project. As the title says, we're looking at tight and loose norms. So what do we mean by this? Following previous work by Michelle, um, we define tight norms as a situation where behavior is very well defined. So a situation in which we have almost um, no variance. And as you can see in the picture, most people behave in a similar way. By contrast, under loose norms, we understand a situation in which we have a much greater behavioral variance. Comparing those two pictures, um, actually the mean and median behavior is exactly different, um, identical. But what differs between the two pictures is um, the distribution that is around this mean or median. So what are the questions we want to answer in this project? Um, in a strategic environment, how do people react when faced with an environment where there's a lot of behavioral variation? And by contrast, how do they react in an environment where behavior is very tightly distributed? To answer this question, um, we're, questions we're looking at a design um, that is um, distributed into three parts. And um, the strategic setup we're looking at thereby is a public goods game. So in the first and last part of the experiment, um, we're looking at behavior and norms in the public goods game. In the middle, we're having um, treatment manipulation in which we show participants one out of six possible distributions. And participants also know that for the last distribution, they have been shown. So how do these distributions look like? they are actually varying along two dimensions. The first one is the relative tightness or looseness of the distribution. Um, so as you can see here in this picture to the left, um, we're facing a situation where behavior is quite concentrated and almost everyone is contributing one or two tokens. So, th so this would be a tight norm. In the middle, we see an example of a very loose norm where behavior is much more varied. And to the right, we also see a distribution which a lot of behavior um, variants but here behavior is polarized with people either contributing nothing at all or contributing fully to the public good. And secondly, we also vary um, the mean of um, observed contributions. So in the first row, you see um, that people on average contributed 1.6 in all three treatments. And in the second row, um, they're contributing 2.4. So we again, we're keeping the difference between tight and loose norms, but in the first row, we have a relatively low mean and in the second, we have a relatively high. Um, next, I want to briefly um, talk to you how we measure behavior in the public goods game. Um, so we're looking at a very standard public goods game with two players and where, where we have the traditional tension between doing the socially optimal thing and contribute everything to the group account or free riding and maximizing your individual payoffs. In order to um, tease out uh, underlying cooperative tendencies and reciprocity, we're using the ABC method that has been developed by Simon Gecht and co-authors. We thereby am looking at contributions to the public good, then beliefs about how much the other player contributes, and finally attitudes, which means fixing beliefs about the other player, saying the other player contributes why, how much do you want to contribute in this case? And this really allows us to tease out the strategic element of this game. 
Secondly, we're also eliciting norms um, in this context to be able to control for them in our analysis. And we're looking at both personal norms and um, personal values, as well as normative and empirical expectations. So what do we find in our experiment? Our main result is that looser norms generate a higher variance in individual responses. And this picture actually is quite striking if you think about the um, treatment, um, the picture of the different treatments I showed you a few slides ago, um, as it shows that when people are confronted with different um, distributions, they actually react in a way that mirrors these contributions. And so in the first picture, those were people who saw um, the very tight distribution and people react by this, um, showing a very tight behavior with most people contributing to tokens. By contrast, if people are facing a lot of variance, that behavior is also much more varied. And this also shows that actually tight and loose norms are self-sustaining as people react exactly in the way they are observing um, behavior of others. And then finally, also very interesting, when we're looking at the polarized norm case, um, here people seem to react quite differently. So some people are focusing on the lower end and are contributing nothing, while others are contributing everything. And this is quite surprising because actually you also might think everyone reacts in the same way and chooses, for example, some middle ground. But it seems that people are reacting quite differently to this polarized information. And we find um, that one mediating factor for this are personal values. And this leads me to the second result, which shows that personal values matter more for individual behavior when norms are loose than when they are tight. And this is confirmed in a regression analysis, as you can see here in red, um, in the case of loose um, norm treatments, personal values have a much bigger influence than in the case of tight norm treatments. Then finally, um, confirming um, previous research, um, we also show um, that high mean treatments here in blue lead to significantly higher contribution levels. And interestingly, we also find that this effect is mediated by the norm's looseness or tightness. In particular, it seems um, that we only see this mean effect if we're looking at high, um, um, high variance treatments or at loose norm treatments. To sum up, um, in this study, we explore how the relative looseness or tightness of norms affect individual behavior. And we do so um, by showing participants um, different distributions um, of the behavior of other players that vary along the dimension of variance in mean. And what we find is that the relative looseness and tightness of norms matters a lot for individual behavior, which means that if um, we want to understand behavior patterns, we should really incorporate um, this dimension in our analysis. Thanks a lot for listening. And if you have any thoughts or comments, um, I'm looking very much forward to hearing from you. Great. So thank you so much, um, Anna, for that presentation. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, so yeah, once again, here is um, Anna's information, uh, QR code, uh, link to her profile, and uh, you saw her email also at the end of the video. Um, I also see Anna here in the audience, so if you have any questions, comments you'd like to connect, um, please use the chat for that. Um, and just before um, I give the floor to, to Max Winkler, our main speaker for today, I wanted to um, remind you that in three weeks, on the 5th August, we will have a talk, a Nobel talk by Professor Sadi Lalou, the director of the Paris Institute for Advanced Study and the chair of social psychology at the London School of Economics, um, called Three Layers of the Regulation of Behavior in Large-Scale Societies and How They Can Be Leveraged for Behavioral Change. Uh, same link, same time um, on Thursday, the 5th August. Uh, we will send you reminders um, to the email as usual. Um, right, and then let me introduce uh, our main speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Max Winkler is a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University with Joseph Henry's Culture, Cognition and Coevolution Lab. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Zurich. Uh, in September 2022, he will join the economics department at the University of Exeter as an assistant professor. And his research interests um, are in development, culture, economic history, and political um, economy. Uh, the talk for today is called Do Disasters Affect Adherence to Social Norms? 
Um, and the moderator will be, uh, as in previous occasions, Dr. Oigon Demand, uh, which is an associate professor of practice in behavioral and decision sciences here at the University of Pennsylvania, and also a core member of um, our center. So thank you so much, uh, Max, for joining. And uh, yeah, you can start. Great, thanks. Okay, good to go. Do you see my title slide? Fantastic. Okay, so uh, thanks for having me. Um, the paper studies how uh, social norms are affected by large uh, negative shocks. And um, I guess we all know what large negative shocks are with the pandemic. Um, so let me start, or I wanted to start uh, with explaining what the tightness of social norms is, but Anna already did such a fantastic job that I think uh, I can speed that part up a bit. Um, so what I mean by social norms in this paper is uh, are essentially widely shared beliefs of how individual members of a social group uh, ought to behave. And, you know, to give you a few examples, in Egypt, about 90% of people um, have the belief that men should have better access to jobs than women. So that's a social norm. These beliefs constitute a social norm. Or in many business communities, and even on the academic job market, as I recently found out, uh, most people believe that men should wear a long piece of cloth that's tied around uh, their neck and that's hanging down. So that's also a social. That's also a social norm. And um, so, for those of you who know Christina Bigeri's work, I might wonder why I focus on on these normative beliefs rather than uh, normative expectations. Um, um, hold on for one minute. I will. Uh, we'll come back to this point, and I will show you the advantage of having this definition of looking at normative beliefs rather than normative expectations. So. Um, Social norms, or the most uh, most work in at least in economics, at least uh, you know outside the lab, maybe in economics, and um, has focused on the how members of a social group should behave. Part. So what these papers typically do is they go to a survey and um, take a question, uh, compute the means of the distribution across countries or social groups, similar to what we just saw with Anna. Now, um, these means then are what we think are the behavioral standard of the norm. So what is it that people should do according to the social norm? What I do in this paper is uh, I study the widely shared part of the definition. So in other words, I just study the variances uh, of the distribution. And why the variances? Well, because as Anna just explained, um, if, if the variance is low, this indicates, and we're thinking here of beliefs, right? Not about not not of actions as before in the video before. And if the variance is low, there's high consensus in in the social group of what's the right thing to do, and this often, you know, reflects or implies disapproval and in some cases even punishment uh, for norm violations. So that's what we you know, call the tightness of the norm. So you know, in eco if, if it's an econ audience, I mo mostly talk about variances, but tightness is really the term that's uh, been used in psychology and, and, and that's like the go-to term for this. Now, um, also, you know, to drive this home, drive home this point, I also want to show you a few pictures um, of uh, real world data. So that's data from the World Value Survey um, on, on a question whether men should have uh, better access to jobs than women. And I'm plotting here the distribution in responses in uh, Aswan in Egypt. Uh, it's a province in Egypt, in, in, the, in Stockholm, in Sweden, and in, in Pennsylvania, since we're all here in Philadelphia today. Um, and um, so, you know, what I want you to take away here is uh, take Aswan and, and Stockholm first. These obviously have totally different uh, gender norms, uh, according to these data. Um, so the means are different, but the variance is very similar. So this suggests that the tightness of these two norms is quite similar. So there's strong social incentives for people both in, Ans in, in Aswan and in Stockholm to uh, behave accordingly. In Pennsylvania, um, it has sort of a similar mean to Stockholm, um, but the variance is larger, meaning um, the norm is less tight, the incentives to conform are lower. Now, here's a second example where the means are exactly the same, but the variance differs. It's again, very similar to what Anna had shown you before. Um, so this comes from the World Value Survey. Um, is it a problem if women have more income than men? 
And in both in Shapur and Uttar Pradesh, we get uh, yeah, a similar mean, um, but the variance in Shapur is, is lower, meaning um, the, the norm uh, is tighter in Shapur. Okay, so um, this stuff has sort of been documented before that uh, you know there's huge differences across countries in in norm in in, in norm tightness. Um, so it's you know most of this started with or all of this started with Michelle Gavan uh, ten years ago when she went out and uh, surveyed uh, perceptions of tightness across countries and she found that places like South Korea and India have tight norms. Um, and places like the US or Brazil tend to have fewer norms or looser norms. And uh, rather than, you know, um, rather than looking at the consequences of this, like in the video before, um, I'm asking in this paper, what determines these differences? Where, does, where do differences in tightness come from? And the leading answer in, this, in the literature is that it's threat or, you know, what I call disaster. So essentially large uh, negative shocks. And uh, the idea behind this is that disasters increase the returns to either cooperation or social coordination within groups. So there is a sort of, you know, a group level uh, benefit to uh, complying with social norms um, that are one way or the other efficient at the group level. And, and that's, so that's, that's the mechanism that, um, you know, Michel Gelfand and, and also other, other authors have pointed out. Now, if you just, you know, if you think about this, uh, or if you take economics 101, uh, basic game theory, you, you, you're like, oh, wait, uh, isn't there also uh, an individual incentive to deviate from social norms, uh, you know, in, in tough times? So might there not, might disasters not make it harder to maintain social norms? If, for example, so the easiest example to think about is you're close to starvation because, because of a drought, uh, do you not have a huge incentive to go out and steal food from your neighbor just in order to survive? Um, so that's uh, you know, a theoretical possibility. And in a way, what I want to do in this paper, I want to find out which of these two mechanisms dominates. You know, if, if we study this systematically across the world, um, which one dominates? And I should say, we already have empirical evidence on this um, uh, from Michel Gelfand and others, uh, but all of this is sort of correlational, and here we're really after the causal effect um, of disasters and tightness. <clears throat> so the paper, in a nutshell, finds that, uh, finds that disasters cause tighter social norms. And I do this uh, by combining the World Value Survey and the European Social Survey with um, different types of disasters, from conflict to epidemics to different types of natural disasters. And um, I have two causal strategies, one that looks uh, at very short run effects, I'm talking about a few weeks before and after a disaster, and another one that looks at within lifetime effects, so longer run effects that run within people's lifetime. So this is not going to be a paper where we study, um, you know, disasters in ancestral times and how they affect tightness today, but that's, this is all going to be extremely micro and, um, you know, as much controlled as you can, given that this is observational data and not, and not experimental data. So that's the big advantage uh, of, of the setup, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not lab. So, you know, labs has, has a strength, but this really uh, uses data from all around the world. <clears throat> all right, so uh, what I do in the paper, or I, you know, to, to measure tightness, I have uh, two ways to, to get at, peop at, at the tightness of social norms. And, and, and sort of uh, these measures come from the World Value Survey and the European Social Surveys. Why these surveys? Because they are the only data sets that allow me to measure tightness in, in these two ways. And the first way is what I call reveal tightness. And it's basically taking the idea of variance and breaking it down to individuals. So I, I want to know how similar someone's normative beliefs are relative to a reference group um, that is very similar to that person. So that's very similar. Um, that's very likely to hold the same bundle of social norms. And I come, come back to this point in a second. And the, the second uh, measure is what I call the perceived tightness measure. It's a simple survey question uh, that asks people uh, how important they think uh, it is to comply with social norms or how costly it is to deviate from the social norms. So these are two distinct measures and we will look how disasters affect these two, these two measures. <clears throat> 
Okay, so to give you a bit more detail about uh, the revealed tightness measure, um, um, the, both the World Value Survey and the European Social Survey have lots of different normative normative beliefs across all sorts of domains, across all um, yeah, sorts of lives. And you know, to, give, to give you an example, um, is it justifiable to claim government benefits to which you're not entitled? So that's you know, one normative belief. Another one is, would you want to have an immigrant as, as your neighbor? You know, it's sort of a descriptive question, but it clearly has a normative component. So I'm basically selecting all these different questions, like more than uh, 160 in the World Value Survey and close to 100 in the European Social Survey, and, and, and work with these, with these questions. <clears throat> Next, um, what's important here is to understand what's the reference group. And that's super hard uh, given this is observational data. So you can't really observe the networks that these people uh, have in their daily life. So what previous papers have done um, is just to look at all people within a country. And, and that's problematic. Um, if, for example, a large country like the US consists of several social groups that might have distinct social norms. So then you could get what Anna showed you in the video before, this polarized uh, distribution with two distinct peaks in the distribution. And then the variance doesn't tell you much about tightness um, because essentially you have, two dis you have two distinct social groups with distinct social norms. So then tightness is not a good measure. So what you want is essentially to define social groups such that you have single peaked distributions. Uh, and what I do is in my baseline analysis um, is to use subnational regions times F, uh, interacted with um, uh, ethnic background, interacted with an indicator for whether the person is rich or poor. So for example, this would be white people um, that are rich and live in Pennsylvania. That would be a reference group. Um, and so this is you know, much, much more mic micro than uh, anything that has been done before. Um, so on average, I have 68 um, reference group in the European data and, and 58 reference group per country uh, in the World Value Survey. And I sort of you know, manually check um, uh, whether these distributions are single peaked and they are. And additionally, I, I don't go through this today in the talk, but in the paper, I do lots of robustness checks with different uh, definitions uh, of, of reference groups. So adding, for example, education, adding um, age and so forth and so, and so forth, um, and to you know, verify whether the results are sensitive to, um, to this definition. But in principle, this works super well. <clears throat> now, the next question is how do you measure um, the similarity in beliefs at the individual level. Um, so remember, tightness is a group level, uh, sorry, vari the variant is a group level concept, and that's something we want to break down at the individual level. And ideally, since we have hundreds of different uh, normative beliefs, we want to have a single index so that we can, can run a single regression um, of how similar someone's beliefs are relative to people around them. Now, uh, first, so there's a few steps and I want to guide you, guide you through them. First, um, I collapse questions into positive and negative values. Um, so for example, you know, if, if you have the option to uh, respond or oh, whether something is very important or just somewhat important, this would just be important. And there's research in psychology that shows that that's, a, you know, that's what you should do because different people across the world have different answering styles and you, you know, which then affect uh, tightness or, or the variance measure. For example, people in Japan, when you look at distributions of uh, people in Japan, they always tend to give the middle answer for some reason. So they have a strong apparently preference against uh, replying, like giving the extreme answer. Um, and, and that's something you want to account for. Having done that, I basically compute the share of someone's beliefs that are identical to the modal belief in their reference group. So what's the share of your beliefs that are identical to, let's say, rich people that are white and live in Pennsylvania? Um, and you know, go through this step by step. For each question, I compute the social norm, which is just the most frequent belief uh, in that reference group. You get an indicator if a given belief is equal to this modal value. And then I basically just sum up over all these indicators or I take the share of, of beliefs that are, um, 
they take to share of uh, beliefs that uh, are identical to the model value. And that's, that's the reveal tightness measure. It's zero if none of your beliefs are identical to the one of the, the modal one in your, in your group. And it's going to be one if all of your beliefs are um, identical to the model belief in your group. That's it. That's the reveal tightness measure. Max, quick question. Yes. Quick question uh, about the measure. So um, this is a specific way of defining. It's like a one zero type of definition, either you're modal or you're not, right? Um, I'm sure you get this question all the time because there are a billion ways of doing that. But have you considered something like distance from the mode, right? So maybe you could like be penalized for how far you've gotten. Like, have you considered that as the reason why you decide to do binary? Like just, yeah. you have some answers. Uh, no, that's a great question. That's uh, something that comes up all the time. Um, there's a few reasons to do it. One is that you actually end up with lots of questions that are binary. Um, so 80% of the questions are binary and then it would be exactly the same. Um, a few questions um, have more than two answers. Um, and remember that I sort of pool some of these some of these answers by, for example, if um, there's a scale from one to ten, and um, using uh, this collapsing method, I end up with one, two, three, so some, something similar I showed you before. So in the end, there is not much to gain from this distance. Um, I have it sort of in the appendix as a robustness check, but just find that this is much more simple and much more uh, you know, easy easier to grasp. But in a way, you're right. Um, distance could could matter as well. Cool. Um, now, so this is fine. Um, there is a second measure, and that's nice because even if you don't trust what I just told you, and you know all this variant stuff, and there is a second measure here, and um, that basically should uh, tell you exactly the same, or should basically lead to the same results. And even if you don't trust what I showed you before, and um, that's maybe something you know it's more conservative, and <laughs> something you have more trust in. Um, both surveys ask people perception of how important it is to comply with the norms or how easy it is to, how costly it is essentially to deviate from the norms. Um, so in this question, people get a description, um, which is, it is important to this person, so you know, to the respondent, to always behave properly and to avoid doing anything people would say is wrong. And then basically they just answer this question from, from one to six, you know, is this very important to me or is this not very important to me? And that's been, you know, super, um, that's sort of traditional way to measure things. It's the Schwartz uh, values questionnaire. So that's established research. And I'm basically uh, using that, um, yeah, uh, using that as a, as, as a perceived measure of tightness. And, you know, just a few advantages of this, uh, of this question is it makes no assumption um, about what's the norm. So not like the modal response where we talked about earlier. And it has no assumption of uh, what's the reference group. Um, it just says people. So it avoids, um, you know, all these, um, yeah, what we just talked about earlier. And in a way, if we have both measures, uh, we can compare whether we see effects in both measures or not. <clears throat> okay, that's it. That was measurement. Next, let's dive in, in the empirical um, in the empirical analysis. So the first, there will be two analyses, one that looks at short run uh, effects, basically within just a few weeks, 50 days. And a second one that looks at longer run effects within people's lifetime. And that's gonna be similar to a different dif difference and difference framework. I'll talk more about this later. Let's start with the first one. The first one estimates the impact of a disaster on norm tightness by just comparing uh, individuals 50 days before and after this, the same disaster that hits their region. Now, this requires you know, dates, the, the exact dates of the interview. And this is something that's not consistently available in the World Value Survey, but only in the European data. And that's why this analysis is, is, is limited to the European data. Now, in Europe, we have a few common types of disasters, um, you know, stuff like conflict, so terrorist attacks, Islamic terrorist attacks, uh, and other types of terrorist attacks, that's in the data. Um, we have earthquakes, there's floods, there's storms, um, and there's uh, outbreaks of epidemics. So COVID is not part of, of, of the study yet. Um, it's stuff like the swine flu or the bird flu uh, a few years ago. And that's all part uh, of, this, of this data set. And it's about 10,000 people from 11 countries in Europe. And within these countries, there's more than 70 provinces or sub-national regions um, that, that I look at. And you know, again, to make this a bit more intuitive, these are two disasters that are actually part of this, of this analysis. On, on the left, 
um, is a, a truck um, that basically plowed through a Christmas market a few years ago in Berlin, um, killed people. And on the right, there was a big storm in, in Spain um, that, you know, flood, you know, led to a huge flood. And that's also part uh, of the analysis. And then we will compare individuals that were just interviewed before and after these events. <clears throat> so, you know, that's, um, here we can look at the density of interviews around these disasters. You could be worried that, oh, maybe after the disaster, no one is going to do an interview. But uh, it actually turns out that, yeah, there's slightly more in interviews before the disaster, but there are still lots of interviews even after the disaster. <clears throat> and, that, and those are the people we will compare. Now, the regression is super simple. Um, you have uh, a Y, an outcome, which is either revealed or, um, or perceived tightness. You have a disaster indicator that's equal to one just in the days after the disaster. And you have the super, super important disaster times region fixed effect. What does this disaster times region fixed effect do? Well, it leads, um, it allows us to compare individuals that live in the very same spot. So living in Berlin, for example, just before and after uh, the lorry uh, plows through the Christmas market. Um, so it takes care of lots of uh, you know, possible uh, unobservables um, across places, um, across disasters and so forth. We just compare people before and after the same disaster in the same place. There's a few other uh, fixed effects and, 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 and predetermined controls, but none of them matter as much as this disaster times region fixed effect. Now, what's the, there's always an identification assumption. And, and here, obviously, it's the assumption that these disasters are, are sort of quasi random relative to the timing of the interviews. And well, of course, like these interviews weren't planned in advance, like anticipating that there would be a disaster, but it, there is a possibility that these, these disasters um, might just have interfered with the implementation of the survey. So maybe they have, you know, there were just few interviews or different people were surveyed after after these disasters. What we do in these cases is, you know, to run a balance table and to compare uh, predetermined characteristics, um, you know, of people interviewed before and interviewed after. And, and this looks uh, pretty balanced, very balanced. So there's no, at least no evidence uh, from given the data I have in the survey that these two groups are, are, are different uh, statistically. All right, so here comes then the first main result. And let's look, let's look first at the reveal tightness measure, so the, the variance measure. And, and what I find is uh, basically that uh, variance goes down after this, a disaster by about seven to eight percent of a standard deviation. And uh, this is reflected not just in, you know, in the same direction and in terms of statistical significance of the effect, but also the magnitude of the effect is almost exactly the same um, with the perceived tightness measure. So that's cool. Um, both measures tell us exactly the same story in terms of size, in terms of statistical significance, and, and, and in terms of direction as well. And to give you an idea, because eight percent of a standard deviation doesn't mean much, uh, you know, is this big? Is this small? Is this something we should care about? It's uh, one way to make sense of this is to compare how much does it bring you, sort of, from a place where norms are super tight to to uh, to a place where norms are looser according according to the data. And eight percent of a standard deviation is essentially ten percent of the gap um, in average tightness between Denmark and Russia, which at least in these data are places with either very tight or very loose norms. So that's, um, that's a fairly big effect um, if you go 10% from Denmark to, to, to Russia. So next, we can also look at the evolution of this thing. Um, and you can do this by interacting the, the post-disaster dummy with, um, with indicators for, for specific days before and after a disaster. And you get a graph like this. So each of these um, on the x-axis, you have you have days two and after, so before and after the disaster. The, the horizontal vertical line is is the disaster itself. On the y-axis, I'm plotting um, the coefficient, so the, the point estimate and the uh, uh, conference, um, uh, con confidence intervals of the of this point in, of this point estimate of this um, of this day times a disaster indicator. And what you see is that in both cases, before the disaster, these coefficients are as, you know, close to zero. 
And then after uh, the disaster hits, this basically within days, this coefficient goes up. You know, it, it, it rises, 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 and then it tops up um, after 30 days or so, and it stays up. Um, and it stays up even if you go beyond this window. So that's it. That's the evolution. So it basically kicks in within days, and it stays up. <clears throat> now, uh, one question that you might have is, well, aren't conflict and epidemics and natural disasters, aren't these sort of different things? And why, you know, should they all affect tightness? And what is this? And we can actually look, we can break down the sort of these uh, post disasters. So we can break down um, the analysis by, diff by the different uh, disaster categories um, that I collected data for. So, you know, we have a few conflicts in these data, we have a few epidemics, we have a few natural disasters. And what I find is that all of them matter, all of them increase both the revealed and the perceived tightness measure. Um, also, they're roughly the same size uh, of the coefficient has roughly the same size. Sometimes it's not statistically significant, but it, at least it shows um, in, in the right direction. So what this tells you is that, well, conflict epidemics and natural disasters do have something in common um, in the sense that they all increase the tightness of social norms. Next, um, we can break norm tightness into different parts. So, so far, remember, I, we, have, we had like dozens of different normative questions across all sorts of, all domains of life. And here, um, I basically split this up by categories that the European data um, gives me, basically. So I didn't pick these categories, but I, I, I draw on the European data. Um, who, who has the, that has these categories? So uh, from ageism to citizen involvement to gender to health and so forth. And I'm, I'm running the, the exact same regression as before, and just looking at these different categories of social norms. And and what I find is that more or less um, all of them are affected. At least there's no clear outlier. You know that's that's negative. Um, some of them are are zero or close to zero, but across the board. Um, there is there are more or less positive effects. And there's a second thing I can do here that I couldn't do before. I can also control for uh, the means uh, or the modes uh, of, of these distributions. So controlling for the norm itself, because one possibility is that the whole variant thing is just moved because the means themselves move, move. And this, you know, this would not, this would then be, oh, it's not the tightness that increases, but it's just the norms that changes. Controlling for these means, and these are the blue dots, um, is basically, it doesn't affect things so much. Um, so with one exception, welfare, all of these point estimates are very similar to, to not controlling for the mean. So that's, um, you know, pointing out that, well, it's, it's really the variance that, that goes down. Um, so it's the tightness that increases after disasters. Max, let me interject real quick uh, with your questions. Um, if you could go back. So one thing, so Gianluca posed the question, which is in countries like the US where polarization is high, um, you know, politics are just such an important topic and people, you know, they, they hang out with each other based on, you know, similarities of political attitudes, maybe even more than you being white and rich and live in a similar neighborhood. Do you have any um, measure, do you have any information about people's political affiliation? And do you believe that assigning the reference group according to that might be an alternative way of testing your idea of, you know, changes relative to reference groups? So is there a way why you don't perceive or pursue the, the politics um, idea or maybe you don't have the data? So it's, it's absolutely right. Uh, politics, especially in the US, is a huge cleavage by now. And, and the European data even has that data. It's something I could look into. Um, I, I haven't done it um, uh, simply because, I mean, it's, Europe is slightly less polarized than the US. So it's, it's not the main cleavage or presumably not the main cleavage. And given these data are European and not US, um, it's not, you know, the first thing I looked into, but it's something I could definitely look into. Great. Um, and then the second one is if you could go to the visualization of the different types of norms, do you have any, uh, um, it was, yeah, this one, yeah. Do you have like any intuition why some shifts show up and others don't? Like, do you have a way of uh, maybe like clustering these different norms, norm environments in different ways? Like we see some shifts and then we don't, right? For policy implications, to make sense, we might want to be able to like predict and say, you know what, these particular areas, we see a shift. And in those particular areas, we don't. Like, what are you, do you have any 
Any idea of why? We no, but you're it? going you're pushing me exactly in the way I want to go. So this is sort of you know a recent graph. So to sort of right now the state of the research basically just looks at tightness and and sort of as a as a bundle of social norms. And and I think one important way forward is to 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 sort of disentangle to break tight, tightness down into different. So you know different places have different norms. Some 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 are looser. Some some maybe tighter. And to understand these differences more. Is something where I want to go in the future. But uh, as of now, I don't have uh, a clear answer yet. Yeah, I mean, one thing you could do is you could probably at least for the US, you could use something like uh, Google search data and just to check out which of these topics are like more like important in like some areas than in others. And then you could see maybe that correlates with how the shift happens, right? Yeah. So in certain areas, you see a bigger shift because these topics are just more important to people. And so that's what happens. I mean, that's one of many, many ways of doing that, right? Obviously it's just, I'm curious, right? It's basically, it's a great Yeah, yeah. No, no, I think we, so, have, yeah. we have the same idea where, how to move forward with this. <laughs> okay, okay right. so how much more time do I have? Uh, well, if you know. like have like 10-ish minutes, if you want to show yeah. us some stuff okay. and then and that's good. 15 Q&A, yeah. Okay, that's good. So um, there is, because um, I also want to, to show you briefly the second, uh, the second analysis, the second empirical strategy. So, you know, all of this is good, um, but, you know, what about non-European countries? We already talked about the US. What about mechanisms? So what is it? Why, why do norms become tighter uh, after disasters? Um, and this is, you know, these are questions that are, I can't really address in the first empirical strategy. And that's why I have a second empirical strategy and that doesn't use the European data, but uses the world uh, value survey data and, uh, and looks at tightness in, as a function. Um, so tightness today, people's norm tightness today as a function of past exposures uh, to disasters. But remember, this is still all within people's lifetime. So it's not ancestral exposure or, you know, stuff that happened 100 years ago. It's all sort of what people experienced um, earlier in their lifetime. Now, the data says data sources are almost identical. Um, there's uh, data, historical data on war. Um, where basically, um, you know, a country gets an indicator equal to one if it participates in a war in a given year. There's data on epidemics, again, an indicator equal to one if um, there is an epidemic in a given country in a given year. And there's, um, and, and this is the part that's slightly different, um, there's two different types of natural disasters for which I have historical data. Remember here, I, I, I need data that covers um, the last 50 or 100 years. And, and not all natural disasters have, have these uh, sort of measures for these, uh, for all the years, for all the countries available. So uh, the first are earthquakes, where I simply count the number of earthquakes that hit um, strong earthquakes, when we're talking about earthquakes that are six or larger uh, in magnitude, that hit your country. And, uh, and there's some population uh, waiting going on to you know, make sure um, that if an earthquake hits a place where nobody, nobody lives, that, get, that gets a lower weight. And if it hits a place where lots of people live, that, that gets a higher weight. And the second are droughts, um, where I simply count the number of months that, you know, in, in a given year, where there's a severe drought going on. And again, there's some waiting going on in places, countries where nobody works in agriculture and it's, it's all tech anyway. Their yeah, droughts don't really matter, but uh, countries, uh, African countries, Asian countries, where that highly depend on agriculture, they are, um, droughts are much more severe and, and, and these guys get, get a higher weight. Now, I'm, I'm using a st empirical strategy that's super popular in the economics literature, um, which looks at uh, people's exposure when they were younger. Um, and previous papers have looked at, you know, different periods when you were young. One of the most famous studies looks, looked at the impressionable years between 18 and 25. I don't really take a strong stance on, you know, what period in your early lifetime is important. I just look at your whole, um, you know, all, all years uh, when you were young, between 1 and 19. And, and then it's super simple. You just assign these disasters to people based on when they were born and in what country they, they live today. And to get a single exposure uh, variable, um, uh, I, I basically transform first these disasters exposure uh, to set scores and then sum them up to have to have a single index. The uh, 
and again, it's a super simple uh, estima estimation, uh, estimating equation. You have perceived or revealed tightness as the outcome. You have this disaster exposure, individual level in disaster exposure as the main um, X variable. And what's key here is that you can include country fixed effects times survey year fixed effects. So this basically takes out all you know, institutions, current economic conditions, um, sort of deep history stuff that might affect tightness. That's all controlled for. And we're really looking at variation within countries um, between different cohorts who have uh, different uh, levels of exposure to disasters. So that's, that's, that's a huge advantage over just you know, comparing across countries and comparing the levels across countries. So that's the, that's the key result. Um, how do you read this? On the X, you have different age groups. So people in their 20s, people in their 30s, and so on. On the Y, you have the size of the coefficient and the confidence interval. And basically what this means, so take the first coefficient, uh, so reveal tightness, people in their 20s. And if the more you were exposed to disasters when you were between 1 and 19, the stronger, uh, sort of the, the, the higher is your revealed and your perceived tightness in your 20s. And, and these other coefficients basically, basically show, so as, as you get older, this effect slowly fades away. So it, it totally fades away in the case of revealed tightness. It sort of smoothly fades away over the years in the case of perceived tightness. So this basically says that if a disaster happened recently, there's a super strong effect, as you know, you live on and the disaster sort of memory fades, um, the effect slowly fades, fades away. Now, again, you can deconstruct this by different disaster types. So doing the exact same thing we did before. And um, you know, I find again very similar results across disaster types. Um, so all of them have almost all of them have uh, positive and statistically significant effects when you're in the 20s and then slowly fade away. So there seems not to be a, a huge difference between, between the type of disaster. There's more stuff I do in the paper. Um, let me jump over them. So I do lots of robustness. There's uh, one interesting thing. Um, I, I, I also look at, uh, so one question is, well, a disaster happens to you, norms become tighter. Do they also, so how does this stuff then transmit uh, to the following generation? So is this something, you know, should we think of an intergenerational uh, process here um, and indeed I do I do have some findings along these lines so I find that people that experience disasters when they were younger do uh, instill child qualities that are related to, to tight norms to their children um, which you know suggests that oh there might be some intergenerational transmission going on well let me just finish off with uh, the part that I'm still working on so this is not a finished paper it's still a working paper and which is about mechanisms so how do I think about this or how should we think about these findings um, sort of the main idea that you know Michel Gerfeld and others have proposed is that well tightness of norms crucially depends on the relative returns to social coordination and basically when a disaster hits um, individuals just tighten up if the potential returns to social coordination are larger than your personal incentives to deviate from the social norms. And of course, like, the, you know, there could be at least two ways this goes. This could be, real, you know, like economists probably would emphasize this, you know, there's some strategic reasoning going on. Um, you know, you update your beliefs, you, you choose to become tighter and so forth. That's one possibility. An alternative uh, possibility is that there's some evolved psychological response to this. So basically it's not you that, you know, make, make this calculation, it's evolution that has done this for you and you just tighten up um, in the moment that you perceive threat or, or, or disasters. Now, importantly, that's not limited to pro-social norms. Um, so it's not just about, oh, you know, should I give money uh, or should I share food with people in need? Um, but this, you know, at least if, you know, the psychology, the psychological response um, works across social norms, even gender norms, even norms that might have nothing to do with cooperation seem to get tighter. And that's, that's something we, we looked at before, the results I showed you before. And, and I'm skipping the last part in the interest of time. I want to show you this last result, um, which basically tries to dig deeper into the social coordination, coordination stories. I'm trying to provide more evidence um, at the question whether it's really social coordination, the returns to social coordination that's, that's driving this. Um, 
And, and how can we do this? Well, we know that uh, social norms are just one way to organize social, or, or social interaction. Another super important way, of course, are states, um, uh, state authority who, that organize social interaction among many other things. Now, there's now more and more work that tries to look at the interaction of stuff like social norms, so informal ways to organize societies, and more formal ways like states and institutions. And one point that has been made is that some there's situations where these two things can act as substitutes. So um, if you have strong states, uh, you might uh, need less tighter social norms. So that point has been made. So if you, you know, buy into this for one, for a minute, then maybe if um, there is higher state capacity. So like in the US where the state is super strong and you know, can organize social interaction, can provide social insurance, then this potential benefits of tighter social norms in response to disasters might just uh, you know, much, much lower compared to a place where nobody looks after you, at least not a state. <clears throat> so we can test sort of this line of reasoning by just you know, running the same analysis we did before, um, but comparing countries that have low state capacity and countries uh, that have higher state capacity. So the low state capacity is basically where you know the, the governments do not organize social coordination, or where where social coordination is much more informal uh, rather rather than formal. And and so that's sort of a preliminary finding in this along these lines. So here I'm running the exact same regression as before, but splitting the sample into places that have high tax revenues as a percentage of GDP and countries where where this is low. Um, so red country, red dots are, are, um, are below median tax revenue as, as a percentage of GDP. So these are low state capacity places. And what I find is that most uh, of the effect, almost all of the effect is driven uh, by these low state capacity places, which is sort of consistent with the idea that, you know, in places where the state organizes social coordination, this effect is much weaker versus in places where social norms are super important in people's daily life. And with that, I want to conclude. So uh, the paper has shown that exposure to different types of disasters increases norm tightness. There is some suggestive evidence that it's really about these uh, returns to social coordination that drive this, although that's still something I'm working on. And a, a key limitation as of now is that there's still this open question uh, you know, what's what's going on within people's head? Is that something that, you know, they, they try to think through strategically and they respond uh, they respond basically to, to strategic context? Or is this something that's more psychological, maybe an evolved psychological response? So that's something I haven't nailed yet. Um, you know, this might be a policy implication, but uh, let me conclude with, you know, what's, why, why should you care about this paper? Well, it's the first identified evidence that disasters affect the tightness of social norms. That's it. And, uh, you know, this makes uh, a contribution to, 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 to a literature, not just in economics, but also in psychology. Importantly, the work uh, on cultural tightness and the work in economics uh, on the determinants of cultural differences. Here, it's really about, oh, shocks not only shape uh, the means of this distribution, um, and that's something we have already known, but it's also, it also shapes, shapes their variance and shapes their tightness. And finally, um, and that you know, goes uh, also dovetails to what Anna presented before, um, there's also implications for work on social cohesion and polarization. And, and you know, it's something I have only touched upon in this paper and something is super interesting going forward. Um, you can think of a situation where, so we all know, or that's work that you know, has been done, uh, in economics, for example, where we know that adverse shocks can increase polarization. And, and here, um, think of a distribution that has two peaks, so Republicans and Democrats. And uh, in, if, if you live in such a situation, if you have a country with two social groups and two peaks, then shocks essentially would lead to tighter, uh, would lead to a tightening around these two peaks, which basically would increase polarization in the society. So that's, uh, yeah, that's another possible implication of this paper, but one that needs more work to be done in the future. And with that, I am done. That's all I have for today. Thank you so much. Great, Max. Thanks so much. Um, great presentation. So I have a couple of questions we have some time to talk about. Um, okay, so let me, okay. So the first one would be, if you wanna just keep them shared, so you might wanna just jump back and forth between some results, right? Um, 
Now, so the first thing that I found interesting was the state capacity angle. Um, I mean, uh, at the very beginning of this speaker series, a few months ago, we had Chris Blackman present his work on gang behaviors, right? So one question that I had, and sort of in a way that gangs can sometimes take over the, yeah. the you know, they enforce norms and they take over sort of, uh, you know, state failures. Um, have you considered maybe looking at rather than state capacity, looking at the more typical like corruption type of measures? So I know they're correlated, but it's almost it's almost like uh, intuitive to just say, you know, does that differ depending on how much crime there is um, and what are your results to load up? So that's you will not know the answer to that. So I'm just like, no, that's but just it's a it's a great answer. comment. Thank you. Yeah. I, will, I will write it um, down. Then Marco had a question that actually you sort of, you answered partially with, with that analysis, but maybe not completely yet, which is he's asking about potential uh, heterogeneous effects in terms of exposure. So you could imagine that the extent to which a tight society responds to uh, a shock is different from the extent to which a loose society responds to it, also because of ceiling effects. So have you tried to like break down what you have in your data based on Michelle's uh, mapping of tight and loose? Like, uh, maybe I missed that. Maybe you did that. So, um, no, that's another great point. I haven't done that. Um, I mean, there's some, I guess, empirical issues since Michelle's data is uh, so, you know, in a way, these would be bad controls, but, um, it's kind of like for, for some fun, it would be nice to, to see if there's any heterogeneity going on. Yeah. Yeah. And just, and then maybe you get this heterogeneity that you see that very tight societies just tend to respond. So do you have a clear hypothesis that would you think that tight societies would they tight more or less than loose societies? Well, probably the potential to get even tighter when you are tight is maybe smaller. So maybe okay, because I, of some de decreasing yeah. returns. Then. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I mean, we have some work with Christina and Simon Gechter where we sort of show that the further away you are, the more there's like room for you to like grow into, right? Because the pull is just sort of stronger, right? And so I could yeah. imagine, but who knows? I could yeah. imagine that the shock maybe applies to those more, right? But that would be interesting, right? Even, yep. even if it's maybe uh, causally not easy to, to construct uh, yep. that. Um, <clears throat> then um, there's a question about does the frequency of shock matters? Did you control, uh, somebody asked that, uh, did you control for that in the regressions? Like how many shocks somebody was exposed to or um, how it matters over time if you live in an environment where they're like, Constant. So get lots of shocks. Um, no, that's another thing I haven't looked at. Uh, so it's not a problem for the first analysis since this basically just, yeah. I mean, even there you could think of, oh, a place that often gets an earthquake. Um, but it's definitely something that's interesting for the second analysis. So yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, for even comment. for the first, right? Because then you have this event study, but maybe you will see this responsiveness to the first shock that is quite different to the responsiveness of the second shock. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so that might work out. Uh, I mean, there's literature now, recent one on repeated nudging and how repeated nudging sort of wears out, right? Because people, it's just responsiveness sort of wears out. In a way, maybe yeah. that's the same type of hypothesis you could you could, yeah. uh, you could test in your context. Um, then David Hall had a few comments. I don't know, David, if you want to speak up and just ask some of those things. Um, I'll put you on the spot here, but maybe... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, thanks. I'll try and show my video. Sometimes it crashes my computer, but here I am. Um, really interesting talk, Max. Thanks so much. Um, I'm thinking from the perspective of epidemiology, when you have aggregated uh, responses to questions such as the ones you presented, um, you don't have the opportunity to uh, sector or stratify your um, data within the country. And uh, sometimes you don't capture um, producers, for example, agricultural producers' thoughts about mitigation and whether or not they should engage in vaccination, for example, the world I live in. Um, why vaccinate poultry if it's not effective? Why vaccinate poultry if the government is going to compensate you, for example? Uh, and that would be an interesting um, dimension to include in your data set if you could. Yep. I agree. Uh, also super important currently. <laughs> Huge policy yeah. implications. <laughs> sure. Expected impact of outcome, in other words. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Great. Uh, Gianluca had a follow-up in terms of uh, definition of disasters. Um, I don't know, like, did you define, like, did you have like a, um, uh, did you have like a list of like, you know, disasters that you just took or did you apply some of your own definitions? So maybe you can clarify that. Say again, I didn't understand. Well, Did so, so Gianluca essentially asks, yeah. So he asks essentially, 
um, how do you define a disaster? Mm -hmm. I think, and there are different types of disasters. Like, what is your applied definition to disasters, I guess, in, in your data set? Right. Uh, so for conflict, it's like it should kill at least one person, I think, or five people, something like this. Uh, um, for I, I gave you the definition for earthquakes and, and droughts, so these should be at least uh, strong or severe, so strong earthquakes or severe. And for the epidemics, it's the same as with um, it's the same as before. So it should kill at least one person. That's the definition. So it should be great. lethal in a way. Yeah. Okay. Great. I mean, Jenduk also dropped a few citations in the chat that you will be able to see of uh, right. papers that looked at this recurring exposure to shocks. Um, of, of different yeah, areas. that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, all right. Is there much, does anybody have um, specific questions? See, Heather, you posted a comment. I don't know if there's something specific you want to ask on with respect to that comment or? Uh, no, nothing specific. I just, I find this very interesting. And um, I think there's lots of areas that like what you could repl replicate this. I was thinking more about um, the proximity to the individual whether or not that particular disaster affected them. For example, you know, we have a lot of things going on in the U.S. with fires and floods and right. storms and then the pandemic and then economic issues. And if it didn't affect you personally, do you really move at all? Um, maybe that is something that could be with follow-on smaller replication studies to test, you know, individual things that change. Yeah, no, that's a great point. That's something I've been thinking about as well. Is there something... You know, is it does it matter? Is it personal exposure, or can you sort of empathize uh, with other people around you? It's something that the current data, you know, don't allow me to do. But you're right; like with other data sources, that would be super cool to do. Do you have Do you have any indication of where exactly? Like, do you know where in what city they live, right? But how how detailed? So I should say, data? like, especially the European data is super detailed. So you know, it's uh, it's much more detailed than in you know than just California, which is which is large. Um, um, often you have like much finer regions and uh, basically if an earthquake hits that region, <laughs> the whole region is affected. Um, so that's good. Yeah, because there's, um, there's this recent QGE paper by um, Eric, um, his last name escapes me, um, where he looked at school shootings and, uh, and how the proximity to the shooting yeah. affects subsequent behaviors. And he finds right. this this distance effect, right? So that's yeah. what I'm asking. I mean, sure, uh, earthquakes are earthquakes, but there are like other things that might affect some areas more than others, right? And so maybe there's a way for you to... No, I to think the constraint is not, is not a treatment. So you have really yeah. good data on, on all sorts of bad events. And it's uh, the constraint is more to get the outcome. Uh, so very yeah. localized beliefs or actions uh, based on which you could construct uh, a measure of tightness. Yeah, great. Um, and so I see Gianluca has his hand up, and that might be then the last question. Gianluca, go ahead. Yeah, uh, th thank you for giving me extra time. Um, uh, th thank you, Max, for the great uh, presentation. Um, yeah, th I, I had this uh, issue in my mind as you were talking. So, I mean, we could have uh, uh, tight norms that uh, are uncooperative. So uh, we could have tight norms on not contributing. So I think uh, the logic of the story is that when you're exposed to a shock, you tend to you know, coalesce to converge on cooperative norms with others. So I wonder whether there is something missing in this tightness, looseness story, which is really that we, tightness is on cooperative norms. I know it's something that you touched upon when you were presenting different types of norms, and maybe this is why the welfare norm stood out as the, the, the one in which really there was a strong, uh, uh, strongest consensus than, than others types of norms. Yeah, so I think that that's one of um, a super interesting questions, and Luca, and one that I, I'm, I'm trying to dig deeper into. Because in a way, um, so if you believe that just you know all sorts of bad events just lead to tighter norms, independent of uh, of the actual norm itself, so independent of the behavior standards, you would expect that in response to to shocks, um, homophob homophobic people would become more homophobic, racist people would become more racist, etc. So this has huge implications and something. Um, I want to dig more deeply into. Um, it is sort of, you know, sort of, we still have to do also some theoretical work to, to understand why this should be the case. So um, all of the work I've seen, all of the theoretical work I've seen, um, almost sort of implicitly thinks of pro-social norms. 
um, when, when they talk about tightness, because they almost always think of, oh, there is some social benefit to tighter norms, be it cooperation, be it uh, social coordination. Um, and and the, the puzzle is, okay, why, you know, why should something asocial or antisocial um, also tighten up? And, and I guess sort of the answers that I've heard from different people is that, well, you, we have something like a norm psychology that doesn't really distinguish between pro-social norms and norms. It's just, you know, whatever the rules are, you stick to them. Um, but I basically, I don't know whether we have any empirical evidence on this, so it's something to explore. And I, I share your, so I share your interest. That's something that's really interesting. Maybe like directly related as a last comment to what Gianluca just asked. Um, there are a few papers by Graf Lambsdorff and uh, his postdoc, especially Katharina Werner, uh, when there were these floods in Passau many years ago, they like had data on cooperation, I think in trust games or something. And then they recollected the same type of data with the same people after the flood happens. And so they have sort of, you know, now the same type of behavioral measures with people before and after they were exposed to floods. And then Katarina also like traveled the world, like did these different things, did the same things with different, in different countries. And I mm -hmm. think often she finds that people start to become more cooperative after, after these shocks sort of happen. But these are behavioral measures, right? So, so right. it might and be interesting. Exactly, so that's consistent with what we have, uh, yeah, like that, you know, war, stuff like wars uh, increase pro-sociality, but I guess what Gianluca was mentioning, or well, yeah, well, at least if that's what I understood, is we also should know the norm. Is it really that people became more pro-social because that's the local norm? Um, and would they become less pro-social if the norms were different? Yeah. Very good, yeah. Great, so let's conclude with this. So thanks so much. Give Everybody should give a hand to Max um, <laughs> for great presentation. Um, and then um, Paulius, I don't know if you have any, any last words. Uh, no, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Please remember in three weeks uh, our next talk. Um, yeah, and follow us on Twitter as well if you'd like to um, get our news. <laughs> thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank and thanks so much. so much, Max and Anna, for a wonderful talk. Thanks. <laughs> Bye, everybody.